Please welcome Dr. Ron Evans to the podium. Thank you all very much, and I really want to applaud all of you for being here and helping us to launch this, uh, this very special initiative. Um, tonight is one of these events where shared passions come together. You heard about what Lisa had to say about this devastating disease, but we're trying to bring together science, medicine, together in a way that we can have hope uh, for the patient and bring knowledge. Knowledge is power and the ability to, and it is the most powerful uh, force on the planet. And if we can bring that knowledge to play on pancreatic cancer, we're gonna have a great uh, opportunity to change the nature of this disease. We are um, very aware that for some cancers, and if you get a diagnosis of cancer, that is a very uh, tough day. Uh, your life has changed forever. For some, there are cures. For many cancers, there are good options. But for pancreatic cancer, there really are very few opportunities to, for therapy. This is a devastating disease. Uh, it's like a sledgehammer uh, is hitting you. <clears throat> and uh, our goal is to really change the name of uh, that game by building an alliance um, that is shown here as the Pancreatic Translational Alliance. This is the merger of science, uh, scientific uh, faculty here at the Salk Institute uh, at the center with clinical allies uh, that uh, are helping us to power the discoveries forward in an international consortium that really is a unique mechanism to change the game with science, medicine, uh, and this international group to help us bring the latest discoveries uh, into the clinic. And by doing so and by building this alliance, we think that we can actually uh, change the game and take something for which we once thought uh, was impossible and make it possible. And so our goal is seeking the cure. We really want to change the game, not just incrementally, but dramatically. And how are we going to do that? Um, it is a challenge, obviously. You know what the statistics are, and let me just tell you uh, a little about, a bit about the facts here. And what you see is that um, over half the patients uh, are diagnosed uh, with the most aggressive form of cancer, which is stage four. But even then, uh, there is a problem because total, 80% of the people diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, survive a year or less. That is a terrible number. And it shows the challenge of tackling uh, this incredibly uh, complicated cancer. The five-year survival rate is one of the lowest of all the cancers. Uh, telling us that medicine over the last 30 years has had very little impact, throwing every possible uh, therapy that we can in combinations of therapy. It is a struggle for the patient. And so we are reverting to tackling the underlying science, <coughs> excuse me, uh, of uh, this cancer and trying to understand why it's so hard. And if we can understand why, we can begin to get a purchase on how we can correct that. The, uh, one of the challenges is when pancreatic cancer initiates in the body, there's a response called a wound healing response where the body tries to wall it off or corral it, uh, and it does that. But by doing so, it protects the cancer as well. It's hard for the immune system to see that. It's hard for drugs to get there. And it protects it for 10 to 15 to 20 years in this sealed container. And it's invisible to the body, although it's there. Um, and so by the time the cancer figures its way out, it seems like it's almost too late. So there are many challenges here. And as you can see that the difficulty in developing therapy is illustrated on this bottom panel where every cancer that we know now is progressing downward uh, in terms of the number of uh, deaths per year. Pancreas is on a dramatic rise. This shows you the difficulty and why it's going from the third most deadliest uh, this year 
to next year, it will be the second most deadliest uh, of the cancers. And so this is uh, an enemy uh, that is marching along. <clears throat> now, I told you that the body creates this shield, and that's the uh, shield that is indicated here. It's called a stromal shield, and it surrounds the tumor, giving it protection, actually nurturing it with nutrients, uh, and the tumor begins to grow, but it's now being hidden. It's growing in this kind of uh, living uh, shield, and uh, because of that, it's resistant to immunotherapy. Uh, it closes off blood vessels, so it's hard to get drugs to uh, get there. The T cells that you want, the immune cells to attack the tumor, are now frozen out. They know something's there, but they can't see it. I call it a Harry Potter invisibility shield. You know it's there, but you can't see where it is. Um, and as a result, you get this uh, uh, inability to respond to drugs, and you've heard about that. It develops uh, very strong resistance to uh, immune approaches and therapy. So. What we discovered, and this is important, and I, I'm ground zero for starting the pancreatic cancer uh, studies here at the Salk Institute about six years ago. We discovered that the shield has a molecular switch that is controlled by the vitamin D receptor, which means that vitamin D, or a form of vitamin D, might be able to be used to attack the shield. And we know that most pancreatic cancer patients uh, are vitamin D deficient. And so we wanted to address this by taking advantage of our molecular insight uh, into, the, into this disease. And so the idea now is using vitamin D, we break the shield open. And as soon as you crack the back of that shield, now we, the T cells don't stay on the outside, they go on the inside. And then we use a special drug, one of these checkpoint inhibitors for immunotherapy that is shown here called PDL1, that comes in and activates those T cells, allowing it to destroy the tumor. And with this, we are now in clinical trials with Merck using their anti-PDL1 drug in combination with our specialized vitamin D therapy to see if we can bring immunotherapy to pancreatic cancer patients. And if we can, we have a very good shot at getting excellent treatment or hopefully and potentially a cure. So we are on the road um, and, uh, in building this consortium. And where do we go from here? There are many challenges. I told you it grows in, inside for a long time. So we want markers, detection of the disease earlier. The earlier we can detect it, the more effective the therapy can be before it gets out of the box. Even if it gets out of the box, we still need to have treatment for patients and to to grab onto the growth factors that drive it uh, forward. And then, uh, the, if we understand what's happening, we need to build an alliance, and that's what we have done, which is between discovery, the science, the clinicians, that lets us battle the disease in an entirely new way. And as you'll see, we're building this alliance, which is an international consortium uh, to help drive uh, the progress in this disease. And so I want to, at this stage, uh, welcome to the podium our newest assistant professor, Danny Engel, uh, who has been uh, powering us forward to help develop the concept of hope that leads to the cure. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and for that wonderful introduction from Ron. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my focus, which is on early detection of pancreatic cancer. My lab focuses on early detection because it is absolutely critical to come up with better early detection strategies in order to improve the lives of our patients. But why does pancreatic cancer early detection matter so much? Why is it so critical? And if you think about what early detection really means, it means that you have more shots on goal. It means that you have more time to intervene. So right now, most of our pancreatic cancer patients are diagnosed with very late stage cancer. And that means their median survival is only a few months. That's enough time to try one treatment. And you just have to hope that that is the right treatment for that patient. And if it isn't, there's nothing else that you can do. If you're able to find um, pancreatic cancer patients earlier, they're actually able to have surgical removal of their tumor and they also have a longer window for intervention. And what that means is that we can try multiple therapies until we find the one that works best for their cancer. 
So early detection has made a huge impact in the lives of many cancer patients, especially for cancers such as prostate, breast, and colorectal. But before the war on cancer really began, most patients were diagnosed with late-stage cancer. And a diagnosis of a late-stage cancer means it's already metastasized and spread throughout your body. These survival rates over five years are dismally low, but you notice that the survival rate for metastatic pancreatic cancer is only 3%, which is much lower than it is for prostate, breast, and colorectal. But the major advances that we've made in the past several decades have actually increased the number of cancer patients that are diagnosed with early stage cancer. And you can see that that five-year survival rate is dramatically better. For prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer, that survival rate is greater than 90% and has led to a tremendous improvement in patient outcome in these cancers. That is due to the fact that each of these cancers has an early detection test. So that means for prostate cancer using the PSA blood test, we can find people's cancer early. Using mammograms for breast cancer, we can also diagnose breast cancer before it spreads. And for colorectal cancer, we can also perform colonoscopies so that we can find their cancers before they are dangerous. For pancreatic cancer, there is no early detection test, so we're unable to find patients with stage one non-metastatic disease. And this is where our big what if question comes into play. What if we could come up with an early detection test for pancreatic cancer? We can completely change these numbers. Right now, our five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is less than 10%. But if we are now able to change how we find pancreatic cancer and discover their tumors when they are early and before they've spread, now that survival rate increases to 37%. That's more than tenfold higher than what our patients face today. So why haven't we done this yet? Why don't we have an early detection test for pancreatic cancer? And one of the first problems is that because when you have pancreatic cancer, it's not like you're noticing that your pancreas hurts. Your symptoms are very vague. They're very nondescript. And you might mistake them to be unrelated to anything to do with your pancreas. If you think about abdominal pain, changes in your urine or stool, this could all be because you ate something funny the previous day. And let's face it, none of us like going to the doctor. So when we're faced with these symptoms, we often dilly-dally until they become more serious. And so how do you know that any of these symptoms, such as weight loss, diabetes, and changes in your uh, digestion are actually due to pancreatic cancer? Well, right now there is no test to do that. But someday what we hope to have is a blood test. But the reason why we struggle so hard for so long in finding something in our blood to diagnose pancreatic cancers because our blood is actually incredibly complicated. If you think about what is in our blood, there's many different things. There are red blood cells and white blood cells, which is what we're familiar with, but there are also signals from every single tissue in your body, from both healthy tissue as well as the diseased tissue. So how do we find that signal that tells us that we have a tiny tumor in our pancreas that we need to have a very dramatic intervention for? And in order to do that, you have to be able to separate the needles from the hay. And so this is an age-old problem. We spend most of our time when we're studying blood looking at the hay in this epic search for a single needle. And so when I started my lab, I decided to change how we approached discovery of biomarkers. Instead of using blood or serum or plasma from patients, I decided to make models from every single pancreatic cancer patient that I can work with. And these models enable me to grow organoids, which are these three-dimensional culture models from each patient, whether they have early stage pancreatic cancer that can be removed by a surgeon, or metastatic pancreatic cancer that can be biopsied by an endoscopist. I can grow each of their tumors as a model. Importantly, while I also have these cancer models, I've also made models from normal, healthy pancreas. And by comparing the two, I can figure out what distinguishes a normal, healthy pancreas from a completely healthy individual, from a model that has pancreatic cancer that is either early stage or late stage. And those are my needles. Those are my biomarker candidates that I could develop into a blood test for early detection. 
And so this is how we're changing our approach and how we study pancreatic cancer. We're making advances in this right now in my lab, which is now fully operational. And at this point, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tony Hunter, who is a legend in the field of cancer research and also one of my mentors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. So I'd like to come back to this stromal shield that uh, Ron told you about. The shield is made up of the cells, the stromal cells that we call stellate cells, and a protein shell that these stellate cells make, and this forms the barrier. So we decided to focus on these stromal cells, stellate cells, and you can see they have a star shape, which is where they got their name. They're present in the normal pancreas. They have a protective role. And we already knew that the pancreatic tumor cells make soluble protein factors that act on the stellate cells to activate them. And so they're, once they're activated, they become secreting machines. They pump out lots of different proteins, including the matrix proteins that form this meshwork, as well as factors that block the immune cells from entering the tumor and also create an inflammatory environment. But we were interested in the possibility that there are soluble factors made by these stellate cells that uh, support tumor progression, so having a, a uh, an actual positive role in, in tumor progression. And so we set out to look for factors like this. And we discovered a candidate, a protein called LIF, that uh, we had evidence supported tumor progression. And we tested this in a mouse model of pancreatic cancer, a genetic model. These mice normally live about 50 days after birth. It's a very aggressive tumor. If you treat the mice with a chemotherapy uh, drug called gemcitabine used in human pancreatic cancer, they live about 60 days. But if we now treat these mice with a combination of gemcitabine and an antibody that blocks the function of the activity of LIF, now the mice survive almost twice as long. And we discovered that the way that the blocking antibodies are working is to prevent a class of stem-like cell in the tumor from repopulating the tumor. And so instead, the tumor begins to differentiate. So with this candidate in mind, we now turned to uh, the human disease, work from the Cancer Genome Atlas effort of the National Cancer Institute, studying the levels of RNA in 20 different human tumors had shown that LIF RNA levels are the highest of all of these 20 tumors in pancreatic cancer. We then began to look at human uh, tumor, uh, pancreatic tumor tissue samples. When you look in a uh, normal pancreas, the level of LIF protein is relatively low. But if we now look in pancreatic cancer patients, and each dot here represents um, a different patient, you can see that many of them have very high levels of, of the LIF protein. And we also found that um, LIF levels are detectable and high in the serum of pancreatic cancer patients. So this suggested then that LIF might be a, a target for therapy using a, a, a blocking antibody, but might also be used as a biomarker in the blood uh, potentially for early detection and, and response to treatment. So as a result of our findings, uh, a clinical trial has been initiated by Northern Biologics in collaboration uh, with Celgene. And now I'll ask Ron to come back up here and um, tell us about the clinical trials that have grown out of work done at the Salk Institute. Thank you, Tony. Uh, just wanted to, to have a slide here that indicates that uh, you can't do this alone by any stretch of the imagination, even with a great discovery or a good idea. 
Uh, we have the most talented people here, but we work with uh, our collaborative partners. They're listed here on this slide. These are foundations. These are organizations uh, that uh, uh, promote uh, cancer care, in many cases specifically pancreatic cancer. These are our clinicians and our discovery group uh, that is putting together this alliance that really makes a difference, that has an international and global reach. And so we really are, are uh, indebted to them in believing in us and working with us in our partnership. Now, we told you about two trials, one that was with Merck and one that was with Northern Biologics and Celgene. But really, we have five trials and probably uh, six uh, uh, that are coming along. And this is a worldwide effort. So what you see here coming up are the uh, sites where, and these are some of the most uh, important clinical centers uh, in the country, as well as in the world. And so we have partners in uh, all over the world uh, and many in the United States that are working with us actively right now to help the discoveries that are made here get into the clinic and to see patients. Uh, and we work uh, very closely with our uh, clinical colleagues here at UCSD, uh, who are our closest alliances, and with our uh, clinical collaborators at uh, TGen, uh, Dan Von Hoff, uh, who also is very critical to building this consortium. So it's an international effort. Now, you saw earlier that if you are diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, the average survival is 4.5 months. What can you do in 4.5 months? Many people don't even want to go for therapy. Um, yet, you have to believe. And this is the way in which uh, science can begin to make a difference. Uh, we have uh, a video from Stephen Bigelson. He's a physician who uh, came to work, was not feeling well, had some tests, and was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. He read material knowing that 4.5 months is what he probably was looking at and said, I'm not going to go through standard of care. I'm going to go through a personalized therapy that's going to be based on the work that's happening at the Salk Institute. Um, I'm really, what gives you hope from the science is he's three years out with this. And there's a video here where he's going to explain uh, and describe his story. So if you can roll the video. My life was, was great. Uh, I had gotten to the point in my life where I was enjoying work. Uh, we were starting to travel. At that point, I was, I think, as healthy as I can possibly be. I had joined the Y, I was working out, and then I had a little stomach ache for a week. And then at the end of the week, my urine started to turn a little dark, and being a physician, uh, I suspected what that meant. I have a lab at my work, so on Friday, I, I had them draw my blood. Friday afternoon, I got the results that my liver tests were elevated. Uh, and by Sunday, I got the CAT scan that showed the pancreatic cancer. So when I was told, um, I didn't handle the news very well immediately. I, I broke down in tears right away. My wife was the one that was, was great. She immediately got to work on finding doctors for me. I didn't even want to think about it. I knew nothing about cancer, pancreatic cancer, nothing. I knew that Steve Jobs and Patrick Swayze had died from pancreatic cancer, and that's about all I knew, except that I knew it was hideously deadly. After I was diagnosed with cancer, we established it was stage four. Stage four is once it metastasizes. At that point, surgery doesn't work. Once my wife convinced me that I needed to try and survive, my decision was to try something experimental. I knew the results, I knew the statistics. One of the supplemental treatments that uh, was suggested at Weill Cornell was a vitamin D treatment that had been developed at the Salk Institute by Dr. Ron Evans and has been uh, showing great possibilities in clinical trials. This was a treatment I was excited about for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one was because it was simple. Uh, it was a analog of a vitamin. It wasn't a complicated medication. When I first really became hopeful was probably not until it started to work. I knew from the beginning that I wanted to experiment and I had a glimmer of hope knowing 
that I was doing something different, something that might actually work. It wasn't until about a month later when I saw my first blood test that my tumor markers had dropped that I really began to believe that this might be useful. Within a year's time, he reached normal levels. And I have to say it was really beyond my wildest dreams. I really, I didn't expect that. I expected, I hoped he would get better. I honestly, I never expected him to hit normal. And I don't think many of his doctors did either. I'd like to thank my physicians and Dr. Ron Evans at the Salk Institute for saving my life. I don't think without the experimental treatment that I took in addition to chemotherapy, I'd be alive right now to give this interview. I believe that that's what saved my life. Yeah. This is incredibly moving for me to have discoveries in our lab that are having this kind of impact. I wanted to show one other uh, feature from Dr. Biggleson's uh, uh, trial. Uh, and this is measuring CA99, which is a factor that is produced by the pancreatic cancer. And there's where it is. It was at 11,574. And when he started the trial, you can see the decline to basically the normal or undetectable level. You can't make up something like this. This is just an incredible uh, statement, and it's very moving for me to see this happen in an individual. And in fact, that individual is right here. I want to ask Steve and Nancy to please stand up. <laughs> And now we're going to go into <clears throat> a little bit of Q&A. <clears throat> so as we try to put a, uh, a bookend on, on this evening's um, program, um, we wanted to end with Q&A with the researchers and, and folks have submitted some questions. So I want to start with the panel and our focus, although we've had the five deadly cancers, the focus today is on pancreatic cancer. Um, you know, I'll start with the panel, I'll start with Tony um, and, and work across, but what's your personal interest in pancreatic cancer? Well, I've been doing cancer research for over 45 years now, and I'm coming to the end of my career, and I decided it was time to take on the most challenging cancer and try and understand whether we could do better with pancreatic cancer. An additional motivation was that one of the founding faculty members at the Salk Institute Leslie Orgel, who died in 2007, died of pancreatic cancer. And I felt it would be in his honor to try and do better. For me, like Tony, I decided to study pancreatic cancer because it is still one of the most deadliest cancers that we really haven't been able to change outcomes for. But for me, it's also very personal. I lost my father in 2006 to pancreatic cancer, and about 10 years later, my uncle. And I'm very well acquainted with the lack of hope and the uh, frustration with the lack of options. And so when I decided to open my own research laboratory, I dedicated it to, to pancreatic cancer and early detection. Well, in college, I lost uh, my dad to glioblastoma. Um, and not long after that, in graduate school, I lost my brother uh, to an intractable form of leukemia for which there was no treatment. But now, in part thanks to Rich Heyman, there is a drug that cures over 98% of people. Um, and so you, miracles can happen. Um, three years ago, I lost my sister as well to uh, cancer. And so this is a personal issue for me. And if you look at pancreatic cancer, it is the Mount Everest of cancers. Uh, it's where the sum is in a cloud. We don't really can't see the full impact of it. But if you can climb this mountain and get to the summit, you will be able to see farther than anyone else has been able to see about cancer. We will not only bring therapy and potentially a cure to pancreatic cancer, but we will open up, I believe, new avenues and new vision 
or other cancers. So it's not just about pancreas and pancreatic cancer. It's about conquering some of the hardest problems. And that's what we do here. We don't do incremental. We are trying to do, go for breakthroughs. And so that's what we're going for. And that's why I'm involved in this. Ron, I noticed in one of your other slides that you know levels of cancer are going down in other types, uh, other types of cancer. The the level and indications are, or incidence of cancer are going down, but in pancreatic cancer, it's actually going up. What do you think is causing um, such a rise in this deadly disease? It's incredible. You see this cancer basically every year increasing in numbers. Unfortunately, it's a very, it's very nutrient sensitive, uh, and we're in the heart of an obesity and diabetes ep epidemic. And both of those problems, uh, obesity and diabetes, are major drivers of this cancer. So it's been following along with that, and this is an intractable cancer. It's also greatly aggravated by alcohol and, and tobacco. And so it's within our realm to control these, but we know you just can't tell people to be good because this obesity <laughs> and diabetes epidemic has been going on for quite some time. Uh, but still, uh, this is an area that, that um, it, we need to understand better and how we can take advantage of that knowledge to change the game. Danny, Danny moving to you, um, and talking about cancer, you know, just m more widely. Um, and again, I get the easy part because I just get to answer, answer, ask questions, but why does it take so long to find a cure? And why do clinical trials take so long over a five or a 10 year period? Right, so clinical trials are necessary to make sure that our new treatments are both effective as well as safe. So if you think about it, um, a new drug, we don't know how much to give a patient, we don't know the best routes, and we also don't know whether it's safe to give patients that drug in combination with others. And so safety is of utmost importance when first evaluating a new drug. On top of that, there's also existing standard of care therapies that we have to make sure that this new treatment adds some benefit to. So either it is more effective at extending survival, which could take years to measure, or it has lower side effects or fewer contraindications. Uh, and so this is why clinical trials take so long, simply because we need to make sure that we're doing more benefit than harm. Tony, how can we bring drugs to market faster? Well, I think there are at least two ways. One is with any new drug that's going to go into a trial is to select the right population of patients who will has the, have the best chance of responding. And so with a, with a strong response, then, then the drug can move forward a lot more quickly. Secondly, the FDA has actually put in place a number of, of new processes to try and accelerate uh, uh, approval of new drugs. They have a new fast track system. They have breakthrough designation and um, priority status. And so I think, I think the FDA realizes that it's taking far too long and is, is trying to accelerate the process while at the same time being aware of the need for safety. You know, I'd like to add one, one other thought on that, which is something called basket trials. Um, and there's a, a new way that the FDA is now considering to, uh, ways to accelerate that if a drug has been approved for one disease, if you can make an argument for its activity in another, they'll take a relatively small number of patients in a rapid trial. The trial we're doing with Merck is that kind of trial. The drug is approved, but no one on the planet has responded to checkpoint inhibitor or immunotherapy yet. But if they do with our trial, even if we get one, two, or three patients, the FDA may very well approve it based on that. This is a real acceleration and one that we're pushing very hard on. So Ron, if, if um, you know, staying with you for a second, if, um, if you were diagnosed tomorrow, what's your advice in finding the right treatment? I'm gonna have my wife <laughs> take control <laughs> because I'll be a mess. Um, you know, it's really important uh, to put together a team. Uh, uh, go to the NCI and, and look at the information that they provide and some of the other agencies. Um, you want to get to a very good clinical center where there are oncologists, 
uh, and therapists and potentially surgeons if it's resectable. Uh, it is a uh, very challenging uh, diagnosis to get, and time is of the essence. Uh, and there are physicians like Andy Lowy, I don't know if Andy Lowy is in, in the audience here, who is a, a physician scientist of, uh, you know, non-parallel to him. And you need to get to people like that who can take care, take your care into consideration, but in real time uh, and be very aggressive about it. But if you're the patient, you can't hear what the physician's saying. You need to have an advocate with you. And then finally, um, I think everybody in the audience would want to know, what can we do to reduce our cancer risk? Well, there are several things that you can do to reduce cancer risk in general. And so none of these things are rocket science, but there are things that we often don't prioritize, like exercise. So exercise is one of the most universal ways in which we can reduce our risk for developing cancer. On top of that, studies at the Salk and other uh, research centers have shown that diet plays a huge role in increasing your risk for cancer and also making your cancer more aggressive. So regardless of whether you're currently cancer free or fighting cancer, having a healthy diet is critical. Um, a high fat diet is very dangerous for developing cancer because it causes more inflammation in your body. And on top of that, um, there are also certain nutrients that it's really important that you maintain at adequate levels. So a lot of us um, become vitamin D deficient with time, and it's been shown through several studies that uh, countries with lower vitamin D levels have a higher incidence of cancers like pancreatic cancer. Um, and then lastly, Ron mentioned tobacco use and alcohol consumption, both of which are directly related to cancer. So uh, it might not be easy if it's an established habit, but reducing your consumption of alcohol and use of tobacco will have profound impacts on uh, decreasing your cancer risk. Uh, and one other thing, you can reduce your risk I, clearly by exercise uh, and a better diet. But if you're diagnosed uh, with pancreatic cancer, you can still improve your outcome by changing even at that point. And so these are really uh, uh, good things to think about uh, if you do get diagnosed, and even before. Yeah. Preferably before. And ultimately, you should, you should listen to your body. Don't ignore symptoms. I mean, Danny showed you the sort of symptoms that might presage pancreatic cancer, and they're all pretty normal things, but you should definitely you know, be aware of what's going on in your body. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Let's... I also want to thank uh, Ron and uh, Danny and Tony, uh, and a big thank you to our keynote speaker, Lisa. That was uh, amazing and inspiring. Thanks to you and Albert for being with us tonight. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming here tonight, for simply being here and for uh, wanting to hear the latest. Uh, you have shown that you are committed to the same goals that we have, which is uh, a world without cancer. Uh, we are at truly a momentous time in the history of cancer research. Technology has finally gotten to the point to allow us to test ideas uh, in real time, and we are, as you've heard, literally developing the treatments of the future uh, today. The future is now. So um, Salk is a place where cures begin, so please join us in conquering cancer. Thank you.